so this is a virtual panel discussion. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, that is uh, hosted by the uh, Department of Political Science and the School of Education and Behavioral Sciences, as well as uh, being sponsored by the uh, MGA Political Science Student Organization and the uh, Alpha Mu Zeta Chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the National Honorary Society for uh, Political Science. Um, before we do get started, I just want to uh, do a couple things. First, we'll tell you a little bit about our department for those of you that don't know much about us. And then also I'll introduce our panelists and talk a little bit about the structure of the event and ground rules and things like that. Uh, and then we'll uh, proceed to our uh, uh, panel. So, um, so our department uh, offers uh, several different programs, including uh, two bachelor's degrees, a bachelor of science degree in political science, as well as the bachelor of science degree in interdisciplinary studies. Uh, we also have several minors offered in the department. So if you're majoring in another field, uh, like say business or history or uh, English or education or uh, nursing or anything like that, and want to uh, learn some more about a topic that uh, is outside that field, that's what a minor is for. Um, and uh, we have quite a few of them available. Uh, we have a minor in political science, uh, a minor in African and African diaspora studies. So if you're interested in uh, the uh, African American experience and things like that, as well as the experience of other African peoples, that would be a good minor for that. Um, environmental policy studies, if you're interested in sustainability in the environment and related topics. Global studies, if you're interested in learning more about the uh, world beyond uh, the United States and things like uh, foreign languages and foreign cultures and uh, foreign policy and all sorts of other foreign things. Um, and um, Let's see, um, also um, uh, we have a, a minor in pre-law as well. So if you're interested in uh, potentially going to law school or doing uh, um, paralegal work and things like that, uh, those things are available through the pre-law minor. Uh, last but not least, we also uh, participate in the University System of Georgia's uh, Certificate in European Union Studies, uh, which is a uh, collaboration between about nine universities and colleges in Georgia. Uh, and we're one of the participating schools in that. So if you're interested in European politics and the European Union in particular, that would be a good uh, program as well and uh, requires about five additional classes uh, of coursework, which might also count towards your other degree requirements and another degree. So uh, without too much further ado, go ahead and introduce our uh, two uh, panelists for today. Um, so um, in the uh, no particular order. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. John Hall, who is an associate professor of political science and has been here at Middle Georgia State since uh, 2015. So that would make uh, this his eighth year, I think, um, if my math is correct. Um, he has a doctorate in public policy and public administration from Auburn University, uh, and he teaches primarily courses in American politics as well as uh, some uh, legal studies courses, pre law type things as well, uh, constitutional law. Um, uh, we also have with us uh, today uh, Dr. Annie Watson, who is an assistant professor of political science. Uh, she is in her third year, having arrived here in 2021. Um, and her uh, PhD in political science is from the University of Georgia. Um, and um, her uh, primary area of expertise is in international politics and particularly focusing on issues like human rights and things like that, um, which um, we'll be certainly getting into today because uh, there are certainly uh, you know, civil rights and civil liberties issues are certainly human rights issues as well. Uh, and then I am your moderator. I am uh, Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm the uh, chair of the Department of Political Science and a professor of political science. I've been here since 2012, so this would be my uh, 13th year or 11th year. See, I can't do math. Um, uh, and uh, my PhD in political science is from the University of Mississippi. Um, um, so um, let's see. So we'll just uh, tell you a little bit about the structure of today's events. Um, so uh, we're going to get started with a few questions that uh, I and the uh, panelists discussed beforehand um, that uh, will uh, kind of give you an idea of some of the questions that you might want to ask perhaps as well. Um, we also, though, do want to have questions from our participants, from our, uh, our audience, uh, and you can uh, ask those questions in our uh, chat um as well as uh make other contributions as well um you're certainly welcome to ask more than one question if you want to um with the caveat that 
Um, we will prioritize trying to answer at least one question per participant. In other words, um, you know, we do have limited time. Um, and, um, you know, well, certainly if, you know, all we get is silence and one person really wants to ask a bunch of questions, we can do that. Um, you know, at the same time, um, we do want to make sure that everybody that does have a question uh, does at least have a chance to ask their question if, if at all possible. So um, we will remind you at various points during the uh, uh, discussion to put questions in the chat. Um, you can go ahead and do them now if you want to, although some of them may anticipate questions we're going to answer anyway. Um, uh, please uh, do be uh, courteous and civil to each other. I know some of the issues that are going to be discussed today may be controversial to some of you, um, or maybe all of you, or some subset thereof. And um, you know, while certainly we don't want to discourage you from sharing your points of view, uh, nonetheless, at the same time, we do want to make sure that all discussion is civil and not personalized and not uh, 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 otherwise uh, problematic. So um, let's see. So as far as uh, specific um, questions, we are or cases we're likely to discuss. Some of these will come up in some of the questions early on. Some may be uh, deferred a little bit. Some we may not get to. It just kind of depends on what uh, what you guys want to uh, ask us, um, but uh, we've uh, singled out about six Supreme Court cases from the last year or so that uh, were particularly important, um, and we'll probably talk about those um, in some more detail, um, as well as uh, some of the legal issues that have arisen in uh, recent months and years. Uh, regarding uh, both uh, Donald Trump as well as uh, the uh, the president's uh, President Biden's son Hunter Biden, because um, I know those have been in the news as well, and certainly they are newsworthy. Um, not to suggest there is an equivalence between the two in any way, shape, or form, but nonetheless they are uh, both both certainly in the news, um, and you know certainly questions we may want to uh, address as well. So um, with all that said, and uh, I know you guys are probably uh, ready to start hearing from our uh, our panelists. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and uh, start with our uh, first question if everybody's ready. Um, seems like we are. So um, so first, just kind of as a, a very basic sort of question, we usually start our our uh, um, uh, presentations on the on the, or discussions on the the courts about uh, just with some general overview of what the Supreme Court does and how it does its work. Um, and this time's no exception. So, um, how do arguments before the Supreme Court work? And you know, can just any case be appealed to the Supreme Court, or are there some particular criteria that go into the question of whether or not the Supreme Court is going to hear cases? So. Uh, either John or Andy, if you want to tackle that one, um, I'll let you I'll, do so. I'll uh, jump out on this one. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Andy, for joining us. Thanks to all of the uh, students and other uh, faculty members who are with us today. Uh, great question to kick things off. How do cases get to the federal Supreme Court? Uh, there's one quick way to answer this, and that is to appreciate the fact that the Supreme Court has appellate and original jurisdiction. The original jurisdiction of the court is quite small. We're going to focus on the appellate jurisdiction. Basically, anything that is in the lower federal courts can make it to the U.S. Supreme Court. What does that involve? Basically, anything involving the U.S. Constitution, anything involving federal law, anything involving federal treaties, uh, this can all go through the federal court system and make its way all the way to the Supreme Court. Anything involving ambassadors, anything involving admiralty law, all of these variables will allow the federal courts to get their hands on a case at the district court level. It can then be appealed to one of 11 numbered geographic circuit courts of appeals. And then if the federal Supreme Court decides to take it, the Supreme Court can take it. In addition, the federal Supreme Court can hear cases that come from state Supreme Courts. So you can either go through the federal court system or you can go from a state Supreme Court, provided the state Supreme Court case involves the U.S. Constitution or federal law or federal treaties. Uh, so that's the general direction that uh, cases can get to the federal Supreme Court. Any of my constitutional law students, we've covered this. Any of my American government students, we will cover this. Um, 
Beyond that, uh, in terms of how cases are actually decided, when you appeal to the federal Supreme Court, if you are incredibly lucky, and I mean about 4% of the time, they will accept your case on review, usually through granting a writ of certiorari. And a writ of certiorari involves one of the only words in the history of Latin that does not roll off the tongue. It does not sound good. So we usually just say a writ of cert. Um, if the court, if four justices decide to hear a case on appeal, the rule of four kicks in and they'll hear the case. You will submit briefs to the court. It'll go through the uh, clerk's office. Uh, at this point, fast forwarding through a lot of details. Uh, if the court does decide to accept your case, then you, uh, having already read the briefs from the lower courts, uh, they will hear oral arguments. Now, there's a huge debate over how valuable oral arguments actually are. Are the opinions already made up? But once oral arguments have been made, then the justices will go into a conference. They will start to identify which direction the court might be going. And when they start to identify a majority opinion, if the chief justice is in that majority, he may write the opinion or assign who will write the opinion. If the chief justice is not in what appears to be the majority opinion, then the most senior justice in the majority will be able to write the opinion or assign the opinion. The key here is opinions. In class, I've said this. If I ever use the word Supreme Court decision, I'm being intellectually lazy and you should call me out on it. The Supreme Court doesn't make decisions. They write and author educated opinions on what they feel a particular case, how it is involved with the Constitution, how the Constitution should be interpreted. At this point, I'm talked long enough to where it might sound like I'm just droning on. So I'll summarize by you get to the federal court through the federal court system, or you can jump from a state Supreme Court if there's a constitutional issue. I'm sure there are a few gaps there. I can turn it over to Annie if you'd like to fill anything in. done a good job uh, covering a very complex process in, I don't know, 30 seconds or less. Uh, the only thing I would probably add is that by the time you get to the Supreme Court level, you're no longer quibbling about the facts of the case. The evidence is established. You already know what the facts are. At this point, you're arguing about interpretation. You're arguing about which precedents apply and don't apply. You're arguing about what precedent should be in the future, sort of. And so you're you're shifting the the kind of outlook you have here beyond what you would see in sort of the beginning stages of courtrooms. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that overview for, for, from both of you. And, and yeah, it is a good point that yeah, in the appellate stage when you're appealing to the Supreme Court or um, you know appellate courts in general, right? You know the the uh, the old saying is you know the, the original um, you know courts of original jurisdiction, trial courts, right, deal with questions of fact. Um, whereas, you know, um, appellate courts deal with questions of law. In other words, you know, what does the law mean? What, uh, you know, what, what is the purpose of the law? That sort of thing. The facts should be settled by that point. I think that was a good point that Dr. Watson, um, you know, brought in there. Um, and always to have in the back of your head, right? The Supreme Court's not necessarily going to delve back into the details of a case or, you know, re-litigate the, um, you know, they're not going to interview a bunch of witnesses and things like that, right? It's a very different sort of process than, you know, what you might see in, well, I would say Perry Mason, but nobody uh, nobody still watches Perry Mason. So um, somebody is calling me, so I'll have to mute them. Um, sorry, hang on just a second. Well, hopefully that muted it. Anyway, um, hopefully it wasn't important. Um, so uh, on to our first kind of substantive question of the evening. Um, how did the uh, Supreme Court's recent opinion in a case called 303 Creative versus Alanis uh, affect the rights of the LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ community? Um, what was the rationale of the court in that case and what constitutional liberties um, were involved there? Um, I don't know if, Annie, did you wanna start off on that one or? I can start here. So this particular case, uh, 303 Creative was looking to expand its business, I believe, to include designing websites for weddings for um, people getting married. And uh, the owner of the business wanted to make an explicit statement on her business website that she would not design wedding websites for same-sex couples, even though same-sex marriage was legal. Um, this was in 2016, so it was officially illegal at the national level. Uh, she was sued for this no she took she took them to court i guess um saying that they couldn't enforce colorado could not enforce its public accommodations law it's known as the colorado anti-discrimination act uh against her because it would constitute 
violations of two of her rights, the right to free speech and the right to free exercise of religion. Going all the way up through the process, the Supreme Court actually took the case based on freedom of expression. Uh, they declined to sort of consider it under the free exercise of religion aspect. So they're exclusively looking at this under whether or not it is her right as a matter of freedom of expression, freedom of speech to write the statement on her business website. And they did, in fact, rule that she could. Uh, and so this is a, um, I don't know polite words for it. Um, what this means is that according to Sonia Sotomayor's dissenting opinion, um, this means that a particular kind of business, though open to the public, has a constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class, which sexuality is. And so her statement continues that the immediate symbolic effect of the decision is to mark gays and lesbians for second class status, because this now creates the possibility that any business could potentially deny them service in the same way by making these sorts of statements. Dr. Hall, would you like to? Great summary there, um, Dr. Watson. Um, to add to it, you really encapsulated the, um, again, I want to make sure I get the words right. From 1964 onward, and this is something we've covered in all of my classes, after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we, we started to recognize that there were certain classifications of people that we will no longer allow discrimination uh, towards, basically race, biological sex, nationality, ethnicity. Recent opinions of the court have actually connected sexual orientation to biological sex. So what this does is it creates a situation where discrimination in areas of public accommodation are somewhat allowed. It, this could be expanded beyond just sexual orientation. It's interesting, and you noted this. Um, this was not a first. Uh, this was not a free exercise clause opinion. Uh, while she was claiming her religious beliefs, evidently focusing entirely on the Book of Leviticus and nothing but Leviticus, um, this was not where the court went with the decision. This was a free speech opinion. Uh, the court was basically saying that they would not be able to force someone to uh, to put forth views that were not their own. That would be a violation of speech. And it's really hard to see where this would end. If my free speech uh, rights uh, lead me to indicate that there are a variety of different groups that I will not uh, allow into my business, that I will not take part in uh, public uh, affairs with, if this this opens a potential Pandora's box, not just for the LGBT uh, community, but for many, many others. So it's also interesting to note that the court was not as specific as they could have been. Um, Justice Gorsuch's opinion uh, didn't necessarily define expressive activity. The lower courts are about to go into a nightmare slash field day, depending on how you look at it, with similar cases that are going to be coming their way that involve discrimination. So where we're left, as uh, Dr. Watson perfectly summarized, it is somewhat constitutionally permissible uh, to discriminate against other groups if not doing so would violate your freedom of speech. So this definitely opens up an interesting, and I'm using the word interesting in a very strange way. This opens up a dangerous area of jurisprudence that we will watch over the years to come. This is, um... This is not without precedent for the Supreme Court. What we've seen is that hate speech, for example, is technically seen as constitutionally protected under free speech in the United States. And the Supreme Court has held that up multiple times in cases. And so this is another case sort of directly tied to that is that you can say what you want. Uh, I believe I had a quote that I wanted to make from Roberts and I can't find it in my notes anymore, which is a shame. But um Gorsuch wrote that the First Amendment protects an individual's right to speak his mind, even when others may regard that speech as, quote, deeply misguided or it may cause anguish. And so this is this is the sort of um, consistent thread coming out of the Supreme Court is that our ability to speak outweighs the harm that it might cause the individuals we're speaking about. And on that same note, something that is somewhat unprecedented about this uh, the court just does not have a lot of examples where they're allowing businesses to use speech in order to discriminate. So that's another potentially landmark element of uh, the 303 opinion there. Um, when it comes to individual citizens, well, then we're outside in many cases of public accommodation. Areas of public accommodation that serve anyone in the public, uh, businesses have generally been restricted in terms of what free speech 
arguments they can get away with in terms of discrimination. Uh, so that's another area where this is um, this is definitely opening up new possibilities for discrimination um, that could be overwhelmingly problematic. Uh, in terms of compelled speech for individuals, the court has basically no history of forcing that. Here, however, it's not necessarily that because this is a business. Um, but again, peculiar your opinion, that is definitely going to take us into directions that might invite uh, brand new areas of discrimination. Yeah, it's a good point all around. And yeah, I think, it, you know, as both of you have acknowledged, right, historically, the courts have allowed for greater restriction of commercial speech, right, or, or non-individual speech or um, or speech related to, you know, making money, essentially, right? And there, there are certainly really reasons for, you know, for that, you know, for example, prevention of fraud and things like that, obviously, are important in, in commercial speech that wouldn't necessarily be the case when we're just talking about, say, individual speech that um, that isn't quite, you know, is connected to to money or something like that or exchange of goods. Um, but here, right, we're seeing a, you know, kind of a case where, you know, again, the, the courts are sort of going to this idea that, um, you know, the, uh, of, for lack of a better term, corporate personhood, right? The, the idea of, you know, the, um, you know, when you're, when you're engaging in commercial activity, you're not forfeiting your other constitutional rights or, um, whatever. And that, that could be an interesting kind of interesting, again, in kind of a, a more academic sense, um, legal development, right? Because historically the courts have been, you know, certainly since the 1930s, been very sort of sympathetic to, um, you know, regulation of a business for the greater good, right? And this might be um, perhaps, you know, a move in the other direction just on, in general, right? Even putting aside questions of, you know, how this might impact, say, you know, enforcement of aspects of the Civil Rights Act or something like that, right, where, um, you know, in this case, right, we're talking about a state law, a state anti-discrimination ordinance, but it's it's hard to see a clear distinction between the argument here and, say, an argument that, you know, somebody would not, you know, um, produce a website for an interracial marriage or something like that, right, which, you know, historically would probably, most people would think would probably fall under the Civil Rights Act, at least, um, I would think so, or, um, you know, without, without doing too much research into it, but, uh, but just, it seems like that, I mean, it was almost like a no brainer that you couldn't, you know, you know, you can't advertise, you know, we won't hire, inter you know, somebody in, in an interracial marriage or something. Right. So, um, so, so definitely right. We're, we're seeing kind of some interesting or, uh, potentially, um, problematic right uh developments there um let's see so um but definitely right uh, an area where again, again we're seeing a conflict between rights um and this is often a case um, another point that's worth making, uh, pointing out is that you know oftentimes the court is in a situation where it has to balance right one set of rights versus another set of rights you know the rights of um, you know, individuals who want to get married to, to somebody of the same sex versus individuals who want to engage in, you know, um, commercial activity, right, in this case. Um, speaking of uh, uh, rights and conflicts potentially between them, um, we have another case uh, that uh, came up recently, actually was decided not too long ago, uh, Students for Fair Missions versus uh, both the University of North Carolina and Harvard College. Um, which of course dealt with potentially different issues, um, and of course that those that pair of cases dealt with affirmative action, right? Which is an area where the Supreme Court really hadn't weighed in too much uh, since I would say the Bakke decision back in 1978. So almost a generation where there hadn't been really a ground change in you know where the Supreme Court was kind of thinking in terms of affirmative action, um, and so. Um, you know, first, you know, well, what are what is kind of the the outcome of this case, um, and um, what was the, what was the court's argument um, for for the position that ended up um, carrying the day, or what was the majority argument that ended up carrying the day here? Uh, John, I'll jump on this one. Um, incredibly, incredibly important opinion that has been a long time coming. It's just that the the direction the opinion went was quite aggressive. It, 
we'll get there. Before we get into the students for fair admissions uh, and their complaints at North at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and at Harvard uh, College, we need to look at what is affirmative action. Now, affirmative action policies are designed uh, to provide a degree of advantage to minorities, to women, to groups that have been historically discriminated against uh, in U.S. history. And this goes along with what, again, we cover in government or American government classes just literally today, uh, when you look at equality of results versus equality of opportunity. Now, advocates of equality of opportunity want a legally even playing field, and we have basically achieved that. It's hard to uh, identify, if not impossible, to identify uh, legislation, federal, state, local, that is discriminatory based on race, that based, on, uh, bio, based on ethnicity, nationality. Advocates of equality of results, however, recognize that discrimination in the past, let's say like chattel slavery for over a century, uh, discrimination in the past that takes the form of Jim Crow laws for a century post-Civil War, excessive discrimination over centuries tends to echo into the future. So affirmative action policies are intended to help people now who have been discriminated against in the past. And the case law is unique in that the court has generally favored affirmative action policies going all the way back to the 70s. Uh, there's a case uh, called the Bakke opinion. Uh, this goes to the University of California. The medical school had set aside a quota, a certain number of seats just for minorities and women. This was challenged and the court basically said no. Uh, they looked at the University of California at Davis Medical School and said, we like what you're trying to do. We appreciate what you're trying to do, but you can't do it with quotas. Quotas are unconstitutional. Fast forward to the University of Michigan, and this is going to give us the what up until this point was the precedent. And the University of Michigan's law school had an affirmative action program that wasn't quotas. It was a point system, basically. It set up a, a situation where you can provide opportunities for minorities and women if it's a small percentage of the overall admittance policy, meaning if you're looking at law school at the University of Michigan, your LSAT scores are going to be incredibly important. Uh, your GPA from your undergraduate university is going to be important. Letters of recommendation are important. But race and status as a biological woman, we're going to let that also count, but it's just going to be a little bit. It's not going to be a quota. It's not going to be something where you're getting into law school because you're a minority or because you're a woman. It's just going to help. That's it. Um, and then we get to the current case. Um, the University of North Carolina, Harvard University, their affirmative action policies were questioned. It goes to the federal court and it is a relatively conservative court. And they looked at affirmative action programs at these two universities and basically said, the petitioners were right, that affirmative action programs like these, even narrowly tailored, were violations of the 14th Amendment's equal protection clause. This has effectively, I don't want to put too much on this opinion, but I don't know how we can say anything other than this. It has effectively ended affirmative action programs as we know them at universities across the nation. There's a lot going on here. Um, there are different ways to look at this. It is very easy to look at this as one of the more depressing cases that you will find. It's very easy to look at this as a case that will make it harder for minorities and women to get into uh, universities, to get into graduate schools. It's easy to look at this as a, an opinion of the court that will decrease diversity in universities. It's hard. Yeah, those are really, really easy things to see. On the other hand, the late Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, back from the Bakke opinion, had once mentioned that affirmative action programs are by definition destined for extinction. There should come a point in the future where we have achieved equality of results, where we have achieved true diversity. Are we there now? No, no, we're just not. I mean, the data show that we're not there. Did the court go way too far in advance uh, ending affirmative action policies? It's easy to argue that they did. I'm trying to show both sides of this and not just focus on the horrible, soul-crushing, depressing side of this. Um, but there was that prediction from the late Sandra Day O'Connor that this would eventually happen. It occurred to me I have been speaking for quite some time, so I'm going to stop now, turn it over uh, to Dr. Watson to fill in any blanks. Uh, I actually find coming in wholly on the this is super depressing angle, and I'm just going to really hunker down on that part uh, because I looked up some of the statistics behind this just to, to really... Um, 
make my uh, opinion as informed as possible. And so there have been um, studies, even recent studies, showing that people of color have benefited from these efforts to increase campus diversity. So between 1976 and 2008, Black and American Indian and Alaska Native people saw their share of total college enrollment increase by 39% and 46% respectively. And Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander people's enrollment share more than doubled during this period as well. And so they made huge advances during this time because it was, um, they were making what we call race conscious decisions. What we know is that when we make race blind decisions, it is people of color who suffer. And so today, the New York Times, not, not today, but in today's world, the New York Times found that students of color are actually more underrepresented at selective universities than they have been in the past because they're still not matching with graduation rates from high schools. And so while we have started to see sort of high schools diversify and 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 graduating students diversify we're still not actually giving them up in the appropriate amounts to to selective universities in particular and so we can statistically show that we have not yet achieved sort of um unquestionable uh diversity that won't roll back as soon as we're no longer focusing on it with our admissions policies Additionally, what we know is that it's not just the fact that everybody deserves the right to have equal access to education, equal access to quality education, and equal chance at these kinds of things. Everybody benefits when we have diversity. And so we have studies showing that uh, teams that are more diverse in business settings are more innovative. They perform better. Uh, there's evidence that suggests that diverse classrooms can reduce students' racial biases. They can improve uh, sort of satisfaction of the experience and, and intellectual self-confidence. You can improve leadership skills. You're getting um, more, every time you get more perspectives in a room, you're coming out with better answers probably, or at least better informed answers. Additionally, at least part of the argument here is that, well, what we know is that because of Discrimination in the past and discrimination today, uh, individuals of color are more likely to have, on average, lower incomes. And so if we're still considering income in admissions policies, we're probably still capturing some of this, this concern. Um, problem is that income alone isn't going to capture all of these problems, especially because you're not taking wealth into account. So income is your paycheck. It's what you're getting monthly or, or biweekly or whatever. Wealth is the, the money that your family accumulates over time. It's the properties you own. It's the investments you have. And we know that wealth and income uh, don't match up quite yet, especially for people of color. They are far more likely to have um, reduced wealth uh, in sort of a generational and family sense. And so tied to the idea of wealth, is where you go to high school and which colleges your high school feeds into and what kinds of resources you have educationally. And so what we have now is a Supreme Court who has declared that it is unfair and no longer necessary to take race into consideration for admissions policies, but they are not willing to address the fact that we still have an unfair world that is stacked against people of different races. Uh, and they are leaving intact the kinds of policies that prefer like legacy enrollments, which tend to prioritize white students because the legacy students from colleges were white. So if you look at like the Ivy League colleges, a lot of their legacies are white, which means that those are disproportionately advantaging those students when they go to enroll. And so we still have harmful policies in effect, uh, but we've now taken away the policies that are meant to help mitigate some of this. That's a great point, uh, Dr. Watson. The when you when you compare this uh, to the fact that legacy admissions are still a thing, uh, we cannot we technically we will no longer be able to allow affirmative action policies at universities to improve to purposefully uh, increase diversity uh, because it's a violation of the Fourteenth Amendment's equal protection clause, according to the federal Supreme Court. But if my mom or dad went to Harvard, that is going to dramatically improve my chances of getting in. So the fact that one is gone, the other is still there is unique. They are also, I forgot to mention, they are also challenging um, scholarships 
that are directed to students who are members of minority groups. And so this is sort of the next item on the chopping block is whether or not scholarships will be allowed to be directed toward specific groups uh, or if they have to allow everybody in all the time. OK, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think, I think you know, I'm going to be giving you a pretty good overview of that. I think the the one thing that um, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a silver lining, perhaps, but uh, one thing that I guess we're noting is that um, I think is often lost in conversations about education and higher education in particular, which, of course, this case dealt with, um, is that, you know, the, the vast majority of students in America do not attend selective institutions, right, you know, um, in the sense that um, affirmative action, although it's important, critically important, um, is, uh, is really a, a, a policy that primarily affected highly selective institutions and moderately selective institutions. Um, you know, it was the, uh, and particularly private institutions, um, you know, since a lot of states had already, uh, for better or for worse, passed laws that had uh, uh, limited or otherwise banned the use of affirmative action uh, on the basis of race or um, that sort of thing. And so, um, not to say that this is not critical, because obviously elite institutions like Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Stanford or, and um, and the University of North Carolina are places where, um, you know, a lot of America's political elites come from, right, um, for better or for worse. Um, you know, you don't find a lot of Supreme Court justices that did their undergrad degrees at Middle Georgia State University. Maybe that should change. Um, and I, I think most of us would probably agree that it would be good if it did change. Um, but the reality is that, um, you know, elite institutions are are disproportionately represented in terms of political power and influence and wealth and things like that in our country as well. And this certainly these decisions kind of reinforce some of those inequalities that already persisted, particularly if, uh, as you both suggested, right, legacy admissions are not um, are one permitted to continue and two are not you know abolished. I'm not sure if there's any sort of from a legal perspective, I'm not sure what the legal argument would be for the legal uh, that legacy admissions are, are are somehow a violation of the Constitution. But I think as a policy matter, most people would probably agree that um, they are problematic. Is certainly the um, the the not uh, some of you may remember the scandal a few years ago with uh, various uh, uh, celebrities and other uh, relatively well-off people uh, trying to use, essentially bribe, um, you know, admissions officials into, and athletics officials into getting their kids into, um, in some cases, not terribly selective institutions even, um, which was kind of a, a puzzling thing uh, in and of itself. It's why, why didn't you just give the money directly to the school and do it the, the legacy admissions way as opposed to, you know, trying to pretend your kid was a tennis player or whatever. But um, but nonetheless, right, um, you know, it, it definitely reflects, there is a underbelly of self-dealing corruption, whatever, right, at, at, uh, that uh, has not been tackled and probably, um, Sorry, ought to be tackled. I think most of us would agree. Um, and again, you know, some of the mostly affects you know lead institutions. You know, nobody in the MGA admissions office cares whether your parents went to MJ or not, right? But again, um, you know, that's um, they do care at places like Harvard and Princeton and that sort of thing. Um, and so that is worth noting, and particularly, uh, and and also, uh, as Dr. Watson points out, right, the the impacts on things like scholarships and that sort of thing could actually be much more far ranging, right? Um, because those are cases that, that those are situations where there are, you know, a large number of particularly private uh, scholarships and things like that that are very much, you know, um, directed towards members of particular groups. Um, you know, um, you know, think of say the the college fund of the of the uh, 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 um, I can't remember the acronym off the top of my head, but uh, I think it's just called the college fund now. Um, and, and and other examples where you have, you know, those uh, those students are you know obvious, you know, um, they're they're giving scholarships to people from designated minority communities and things like that, and those could be. And and those students could be attending, you know, non-selective institutions. In, my, in some in many cases, probably are. Um, let's see. So um, 
So I think uh, for our next question, we will uh, move away from the Supreme Court for a little bit um, and uh, move towards um, kind of some more general, a couple of general, more constitutional questions, if you will, um, since this is sort of also an observation of uh, Constitution Day, although Constitution Day was technically on Sunday, um, but nonetheless, I guess we'll call it Constitution Week. Um, and so we did want to talk a little bit about the Constitution more generally. And one thing, one provision, one aspect of the Constitution that's been the news of late um, is uh, part of the 14th Amendment, um, known as the uh, quote-unquote insurrection clause. I believe it's uh, the third clause, if I'm not mistaken, of, of the 14th Amendment uh, that deals with, uh, among other things, uh, uh, essentially saying that people that have participated in rebellion or other crime against the United States um, are disqualified from holding public office right under the United States. And um, I mean, obviously, the context of the 14th Amendment uh, or 14th Amendment, rather, um, is that um, you know, to, uh, immediately in the aftermath of the Civil War to, you know, do a lot of things uh, to correct issues that were related to the Civil War. Um, but, um, but, uh, but obviously the term, you know, the 14th Amendment was not phrased to just narrowly confine itself to the circumstances immediately after the Civil War. And so people have asked the question of, um, given the, uh, um, role of, of former President Trump in uh, perhaps uh, ginning up uh, the uh, uh, the riot slash attack on the Capitol on uh, January 6, uh, 2021, um, whether or not uh, that would uh, constitute such a you know an act of uh, insurrection or or, or um, uh, whatever sort of uh, synonym you want to use there um, that would uh, uh, you know constitute a via, you know something that could disqualify him disqualify him from office and so the question i guess essentially is first is this um is this even plausible um i guess second perhaps more interesting from more of an academic perspective is you know what process if any exists to carry this out into the force in other words you know um you know just because the 14th amendment says something doesn't necessarily mean that anybody is actually obliged to do it. Um, and so, um, so I don't know if either of you are particularly enthusiastic about tackling that one, but. Uh, I don't know if it's my turn or yours. I lost track. Maybe mine this time. I, I think, think it might be Annie's turn. Yeah. Okay. Before going. So part of the problem is that the constitution doesn't define insurrection. It names it, but it doesn't define it. And so it's difficult to um, to know or to sort of contradict people who argue that this doesn't apply um, because without defining it, anything could apply or not apply, sort of. Uh, and so that's part of the concern here is that it itself does not define what an insurrection is. It also doesn't say who enforces it. And so there are a couple of options here, uh, sort of. Theoretically speaking, states get to set their own election policies. They running elections is a state power. And so state election officials could reject Trump's application to be on the ballot. Um, some have said that they would be willing to do that. Some have explicitly stated that they would not be willing to do that. And so there's going to if that is where we let this fall, if that's who we leave carrying this clause out to uh, mixed results, probably. For states that take his name off of the ballot, he is very likely to sue. And so what we are going to see at that point is a, a case that will probably eventually make its way to the Supreme Court and you have the Supreme Court deciding. Uh, whether or not he was involved in insurrection to the degree that it takes to remove him from the ballot is kind of a different question. So when you look at the January 6th, House panel, the investigative panel, what they concluded was that he was. Uh, they found that he had obstructed an official proceeding, that he engaged in conspiracy to defraud the U.S., that he engaged in conspiracy to knowingly make a false statement, and that he had assisted, aided, or comforted an insurrection is sort of formal language there, and thus recommended criminal charges. But as far as I know, he has not received criminal charges specifically related to the insurrection. He has received criminal charges related to other aspects of this. I'm happy to be corrected. 
um, what I had seen today was that was that no that he had not received these specific charges, uh, just others. And so everyone's kind of tiptoeing around the insurrection term, uh, and I think that's probably where the Supreme Court comes in to decide whether or not that's what the Constitution is referring to. Mm-hmm. How they will side, I I will not uh, say a firm response to that one. I would guess, if I had to guess, it's a conservative supermajority. Three of the justices were appointed by Trump. And so I would find it difficult to believe that they would rule uh, or that their opinion would come down uh, against him. But I'm a little bit pessimistic at heart, probably. Dr. Hall? Great summary there. Um, I'd like to point out that you nailed it there. It could very easily be state governments uh, who have the constitutional power over the time, place, and manner of elections. Um, it's not just insurrection. Article uh, the 14th Amendment, Article 3, uh, also mentions insurrection, rebellion, providing aid and comfort to the enemy. If there were a conviction of President Trump for the January 6th insurrection, then I think this would be a much, much higher probability uh, that 14th Amendment um, antiquated, though very much still real uh, realities could kick in. Um, We have some precedent here. If you were literally taking part in the January 6th uh, insurrection, uh, state governments have already uh, taken action there in New Mexico in uh, 2022. uh, A a gentleman by the uh, name of Griffin, I can't remember the first name, uh, was removed from the ballot for county commissioner because he took part in the January 6th um, insurrection. The January 6th insurrection is not it's important to note what was happening. This was not a random day. Uh, this was the day where Congress was tallying the electoral votes from the 50 states. It was quite purposeful. It was literally designed to get a large number of people unimaginably breaking into the Capitol without getting shot and having them go in and do whatever. The, what was going to happen on January 6th, I, I believe it could have been exponentially worse, especially if you've seen the House investigation over a multitude of months. Um, Having said all of that, at the end of the day, can the 14th Amendment be used if President, former President Trump were connected to the insurrection on January 6th, if he were convicted in a court, federal court, could it be used to uh, preclude him from running for office? Absolutely. Um, Do I think it will? Probably not. Um, If it were to occur, as, uh, either at, if, mu- if a multitude of states were to begin taking him off the ballot for this very reason, it would, of course, go to the federal Supreme Court. I will jump out on a limb and say that this 6-3 um, supermajority conservative court would probably err on the side of allowing President Trump to run. Uh, that is pure opinion, and it is absolutely without any value. Um, but and when I say supermajority conservative court. I don't mean that as a good or a bad. This is content neutral. The court historically is the more conservative branch of government, uh, but it's not 5-4 as it has been for, you know, for most of my generation. This is 6-3. I don't think this court would allow him to be removed from the ballot under 14th Amendment violations, uh, although he could. But with that being said, I'll leave it at that. Forgive the anticlimactic finish. (laughs) I do want to add, uh, so technically a conviction is not required to use this clause of the 14th Amendment. We've been talking about convictions. We've been talking about these criminal charges. Technically, that's not required for it to be applied. But if we're looking at the sort of legal arguments, especially traveling up to the Supreme Court, uh, that would be sort of more helpful in building a case, probably. Um, That being said, for convictions for other things, uh, there's nothing that says that someone who has a criminal conviction on their record can't run for president or can't hold office. Uh, You can um, campaign for office while within prison. It would be harder, but possible. It would be legal. Um, You can run, you can, so all of these things, even if he were convicted on other charges would still be possible for him, would still be legal. Uh, it's just this case of trying to to conceive what the legal argument specifically would be for using this clause uh, where that conviction would be um, useful. Also, one other element that I have skipped, um, there, not that either party has the super majorities in the House or the Senate, but it could be a moot point with the court because two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate 
under the 14th Amendment have the ability to basically forgive this. So for those who literally fought against the Constitution, for those who swore to protect and defend it, and then went off and created a new nation state that was literally never recognized by any nation state on the planet, including the United States, of course, I'm referring to the Confederacy, the House and the Senate, two thirds vote, they could be allowed back in. Uh, that is still there, but uh, neither party has that. So that's kind of a moot point. And to, to give the other side, the other sort of argument to this, uh, as I was preparing for today, I saw a lot of people arguing that this should not be a question for the judicial branch at all, that the American people should be allowed to decide. And so allow his name to be on the ballot, uh, let the people decide if they're willing to vote for him or not, uh, was the sort of other side of this, this argument for people who don't um, who don't believe that he should be sort of restricted at all. And so that would be the kind of alternative approach to this, would be to let the people decide if they're willing to vote for someone who's engaged in these activities. That is a great point that I've not seen a lot. Um, however, for those who think the court shouldn't have anything to do with this, I would argue that a belief that the federal Supreme Court doesn't have the ability to interpret the Constitution, I would disagree wholeheartedly. But I, that is a, and I know that's not your point, but that is an interesting uh, angle to look at this. Let the electoral process decide. And just to follow up on that, first, we've got, you know, some chat discussion about this. And also, I, I think that it's worth pointing out that a couple of things. First, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court does have something in that's referred to as the political co question co doctrine, right? Essentially a question where it says that while theoretically it might be a legal question, in practice, it's a decision that ought to be left to the elected branches of government. Um, and you could argue that for better or for worse, uh, you know, the Supreme Court uh, or sorry, the, you know, the the Congress, the other the other co-equal branch of government has, um, you know, reviewed um, President Trump's conduct in office and uh, twice um, impeached him twice, failed to remove him from office twice, failed to disqualify him from future office twice. Um, and that political decision um, would arguably trump any, no pun intended, um, you know, any, any sort of judicial determination of whether or not he engaged in an insurrection, right? You know, if, if the people's representatives have already decided that, um, or at least not enough of the people's representatives have already decided uh, that he should be d disqualified from office, then what what role does the unelected judiciary have to make that decision, right? I think you could at least plausibly make that argument. I think that might be a core argument that um, the Supreme Court majority would probably make, right, is that, you know, this essentially, you know, this has been asked and answered um, in this particular case. Um, you know, getting to the the question of other convictions, yeah, I, I think this is an important point, right? We've had presidential candidates actually run for office from prison before. Um, most famously, Eugene Debs in uh, 1920 ran for president as the Socialist Party candidate while he was in federal prison. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, um, you know, had he been elected, um, he, he said he was going to pardon himself, uh, and, uh, which I guess was the only way he was going to serve as president. But, uh, you know, the reality is that, um, one, he only got like 3% of the vote or something like that anyway. Um, and the, the other point, you know, here is of course that, um, you know, Debs, um, you know, had no realistic shot at the presidency or anything like that. Um, but but more generally speaking, the Constitution really is silent about this question of whether or not a prisoner, a, crim a criminal can run for office with this one exception of the 14th Amendment here, right? Um, and so people, people have said, okay, well, what if, you know, Donald Trump is convicted in Georgia, for example, uh, for his, uh, you know, participation, the various quote unquote perfect phone calls um, that uh, he made to try to, uh, you know, find 12,000 votes uh, after the election here in Georgia. And the answer is, well, it really doesn't matter, right? Um, you know, theoretically, he could be you know, sitting down the road in Macon State Prison um, and be president at the same time. Um, the Constitution is set, you know, doesn't say you can't be, <laughs> you, you know, um, you can't be a prisoner and president at the same time. Um, now, how that would work in practice, God knows, um, you know, um, again, you know, the courts would probably have to weigh in on that, right? And, you know, I guess you could argue maybe the supremacy clause says, well, if he's president, you have to lay him out of jail, at least to be president. I don't know. Um, because otherwise you'd be interfering with a federal official and all sorts of things. Who knows how that would play out, right? Um, 
hopefully we don't get to find out one way or the other. Um, but um, but it is worth pointing out, right, that, um, you know, we're definitely in unexplored territory, right? But again, you know, who, um, and I guess the other, other thing worth mentioning here also is that we also have this complicating factor of the Electoral College. Just because he's on the ballot or not on the ballot doesn't necessarily stop presidential electors from voting for him, right? I mean, theoretically, um, you know, even if he's disqualified from the ballot, there's a good chance that Republican presidential electors would defect from whoever they are supposedly going to vote for and vote for Trump if they feel like he's been wronged or that sort of thing, right? Faithless electors could be a possibility. Um, and, you know, there's nothing that, you know, again, you know, could the 14th Amendment bind electors not to vote for somebody that's, how would that even work, right? Um, yeah, the 14th Amendment, are, you know, it's one of those things where um, the the textual elegance of it perhaps is good, um, but um, I, th I think a more modern sort of lawyer probably would say, well, wait a minute, we need to kind of fill in some details here, right? Um, which I think might be true of the Constitution in general. I think when you look at modern constitutions in general, they tend to be a bit more detailed than our Constitution for this very reason that, you know, the, you know uh, over the two and a quarter centuries that we've had, you know, constitutional government in the United States, um, you know, one of the things that people have learned from our Constitution is that a, a vague and flexible Constitution has its merits, but at the same time, specificity is nice too. Um, and I think if you look around comparatively, if you look at, say, you know, constitutions of countries like Japan or Germany or, you know, countries that wrote constitutions in, you know, the last hundred years or so, you'll see that they, they tend to be a lot more detailed um, and tend to, um, but also tend to also be loaded up with a lot more exceptions and a lot more caveats and a lot more um, complexity as well, which may or may not uh, be a benefit. I don't know. But um, arguably one of the benefits of our constitution is that it's reasonably short and reasonably readable. Um, you don't want the Alabama constitution as your national constitution. Um, not to pick on Alabama in particular, but but we always pick on Alabama because Alabama has a ridiculous constitution. Um, and that, you know, um, if you ever take a state and local government class, you'll learn that, it, you know, basically it gets into the details of like, you know, the, you know, the tax rates of particular counties and things like that, which, you know, is just kind of ridiculous detail for a state constitution to get into. Um, let's see. Um, so just a couple of, uh, has president violated the presidential records act again, um is that really at the level of violating the oath of office to the point that he would be you know again that would be an interpretation thing for the courts right um i again kind of going through the uh um uh, questions here real quick to see if there's anything else on trump um so um i think we're gonna have to leave that one as kind of a uh to be determined um and maybe hopefully not to be determined i don't know um although it's increasingly look like it's going to be determined at least one uh, at least on the republican side if nothing else um um no matter what uh, other candidates may want to think about it um although things have changed before right um you know, nobody has ever won a lot of money predicting um what's going to happen with donald trump so i would <laughs> Um, except him staying out of jail usually is, yeah, stay, you know, that's usually a safe bet, but, um, in any event, um, so let's, uh, turn a little bit away from the Supreme Court to bring up, um, I guess, I don't know, in the interest of balance is not quite the right way to put it, but, um, certainly we know that, um, um, Joe Biden has a son that's a bit of a, um, screw up, I think to put it politely, um, <laughs> Um, uh, Hunter Biden, who's uh, found himself in some legal difficulties due to, uh, uh, among other things, I mean, and legally his, his immediate difficulty has to do with his application for a firearm and things like that, um, and then some other things related to that in terms of you know his interactions with investigators, uh, more broadly questions about you know his involvement with uh, a company that had business with the Ukrainian government that was under investigation and all this other stuff. Um, 
what are the you know, can can what are the can, what is the fifty thousand foot overview of his legal troubles and how might those actually you know from a political perspective a legal perspective how might the, might those actually come to affect uh, President Biden particularly um, in terms of you know first um, you know any sort of you know I know there's certainly been discussion of although not actual action on impeachment um, but also um, just kind of more generally speaking, politically, um, you know, we know that scandals has, have historically been uh, important in terms of presidential elections. I would imagine this one, even though it might not be as directly related to Biden as, say, others from, say, you know, the, the Clinton email scandal or some of the others. Um, yeah, well, what are the... Uh, what, uh, what is the likely impact of this, if any, uh, on the uh, uh, presidential race? So um, I think we're back to John's turn, if I'm not mistaken. So. Uh, well, regarding Hunter Biden, um, it's important to note he's not running for federal or state office. So there's that. Uh, we also have uh, the uh, there was a House Oversight Committee that has investigated this. Uh, there have been no connections identified between Hunter Biden and his father, the president of the United States. Uh, the Republicans are currently uh, investigating further, but so far, I think the the million dollar question is, what does this have to do with President Biden? Does President Biden have any relations with any possible allegations of wrongdoing by his son? And the answer is no. So from that perspective, what effect will this have on the Biden administration's run for reelection in 2024? I'm going to argue literally none. I don't think any Republicans will turn around and vote for President Biden uh, because it after the new Republican investigation, nothing turns up. If nothing turns up, which nothing's turned up in the past, I don't think any Republicans are going to vote for President Biden because of that. I don't think any Democrats are going to vote for President Trump uh, if anything uh, does surface here. But maybe if the connection to President Biden does, but so far nothing has surfaced in terms of any connections. With all of that being said, um, most recently, uh, Hunter Biden's legal woes uh, include an indictment in a federal court in Delaware. Uh, on gun charges. Now, you might wonder what gun charges are these. He applied for a gun. I forgot what type. Maybe a, I don't know if it was a 38 special or nine millimeter, a handgun um, back in 2018 uh, during a time when he has also admitted to being under not necessarily the influence, but definitely struggling with his addiction to crack cocaine. Uh, and if anyone here has uh, filed for a gun permit, your addiction to crack cocaine while applying for your gun permit is it's frowned upon. Uh, so that's what he's looking at immediately in terms of the gun charges. He uh, is basically being accused of multiple counts of falsifying documents when he was applying for his gun. If you go back several years, uh, there have also been investigations into Hunter Biden regarding his uh, profits from domestic and particularly overseas um, investments and whether and there were questions raised as to whether or not he had a pre, uh, had paid uh, an appropriate amount of taxes. Now, this all gets lumped into a very complex plea arrangement uh, that fell apart very recently uh, where he had immunity granted to him. Now the question is, does that immunity still apply? At the end of the day, the unless I miss something, and I don't think I have, all of the questionable taxes that were potentially not paid in full have now been paid in full. As a matter of fact, for quite some time, they've been paid in full. The current investigation regarding the gun charges is definitely still very much a serious offense. Um, it is not something to be taken lightly. Hunter Biden, by definition of being indicted on these gun charges, it has a serious problem. President Biden does not. Um, there might be about a million details that can be filled in, and I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Watson or Dr. Lawrence to fill it in. But again, how will this impact the presidential election of 2024? I can't imagine that it will. Uh, obviously, you have the all important independent voter, uh, the undecided voter, undecided between President Biden, President Trump, undecided. Uh, that's an interesting group of the electorate right there, but I just don't see this really having a huge impact on the 2024 election. I I have to agree. I, I think you've done a, a great job covering the sort of details of the matter here and its implications. I think ultimately, if this uh, is going to have any kind of effect, it's basically a distraction, I guess, from the actual issues, from the actual politics at play. 
Um, there are probably some voters in the United States who are undecided between the two. And if they're getting more stories about this and hearing more stories about this, uh, maybe that affects their vote in some way. But it, it, I would also be shocked if this was the thing that determined the outcome of the election in any meaningful way. I agree. And I think it's important to note. And again, this is neither here nor there. This is content neutral. But if this Hunter Biden issue were to continue, I'm sure it will continue. It will not go away. Uh, if I were a Republican strategist, I would never let this go away. I would keep it out there. In 2024, we already have two scheduled, uh, one state and one federal criminal court um, cases that will involve the presumptive Republican candidate, Donald Trump. He will literally be in court. So it, there's a lot of noise that's going to be coming out in 2024. So whoever it was that asked uh, or recommended that we should live in interesting times, we are. And I'm ready for boring. Tell people all the time that no political scientist worth their salt wants to live in interesting times. We like our politics boring. Exactly. Predictable. So that's a good point. Um, you know, I think that uh, one thing to... To bear in mind is I'm, I'm I mean just kind of thinking to 2024 and what you know the politics of it right moving a little bit away from the the law of it um, when you look at uh, the 2016 campaign right you know um, you know if you look back into the campaign you know that um, that President Trump then candidate Trump um, was his tactic uh, his frequent tactic was essentially to try to muddy the waters right essentially to, and create a, an appearance of false equivalence or or at least to, I guess I, you know, the the way I, I would think is to kind of say, okay, well, yeah, I'm corrupt, but they're corrupt too. So, you know, what's the difference? You might as well stay home, right? I mean, that was kind of the the implicit message that came out of the Trump campaign a lot of the time. Was, you know, for example, when he uh, uh, decided he was going to invite uh, some of the women that he accused uh, former President Clinton of sexual harassment to uh, one of the debates as his guests, right? I mean, just sort of a tawdry sort of exercise, but it was designed to show, essentially say, well, you know, the Clinton, just just a reminder, the Clintons are just uh, are corrupt and, you know, yeah, I'm corrupt too. I, I freely admit I'm corrupt. Um, I'm not really corrupt, but I am corrupt, right? That that sort of thing. Um, and I think you, uh, you know, for 2024, I think, you know, this creates an obvious opportunity for him to repeat that playbook, right? Essentially where he can say, well, you know, yeah, you know, you know, my my son was off, or my son-in-law was off, you know, cutting billion-dollar deals with the Saudis um, while they were beheading and you know doing all these horrible things to American journalists and all this other thing. Um, but you know, Hunter Biden was doing a bunch of cracks. So really, what's the difference? He might as well just stay home. It's just a you know, it's just Washington insiders getting themselves rich anyway. So why not why not make me rich and uh, because I'm rich anyway, right? Um, I mean, you know, there's no logical real argument there uh, per se, uh, except that, well, you know, I'm an outsider, even though I'm not, even though I've been protected by the political class my entire adult life, even though I probably should have been in prison back in the 80s for, um, you know, investment fraud and tax fraud and a bunch of other things. Um, not me personally, him, obviously, uh, but, um, you know, um, housing discrimination. I mean, you name it. He was doing all this stuff in the 80s back in New York and nobody did anything about it. Right. Um, groping women. I'm just going to go ahead and and, women, and, yeah. and remind us of the, the, the assault. Just yes. Yeah, and, and treating his uh, current and former and uh, wives like garbage and, you know, uh, his children like garbage at times. Um you know, I think he referred to one of his daughters as, you know, with, with a pejorative term at one point. I mean, you know, I mean, the man is a piece of work. I mean, let's, let's be perfectly honest here. Um, let's lay it on the table and unapologetically a piece of work. Um, and and frankly, that's, you know, why some people vote for it, um, which, um, you know, I, I, I can't really wrap my head around at some level, but you know, at the same time, I've looked at enough politics around the world to just say, well, you know, there are there are, there are voters out there who just want to burn it all down, right? Um, and they're not just in the United States, right? You see it in 
You see it in Italy, you see it in Hungary, you see it in Thailand, you see it in a lot of countries, um, you know, where where the voter, you know, there's this angry, dispossessed, disenfranchised, maybe population that basically just wants to to watch it all burn. Um, Germany, France, right? I mean, we see, you know, all these, and not always on the right, but oftentimes on the right. Um and and Trump is just the the American manifestation of that, right? Which, um, having said all that, um, you know, with, with Biden, I think the you know with Hunter Biden, I mean, the the real question is, is there any fire to the smoke, right? And you know the the one thing that you know, uh, uh, and this is me speaking from my personal sort of thought process, if nothing else. You know, the question that is inevitably going to be asked uh, is, you know, why are these people paying this guy millions of dollars a year if he's not doing anything for them, right? And at the end of the day, which maybe they're stupid, you know, I mean, there's a lot of dumb money in politics, right? There's a lot of dumb money in corporations. People will pay people money to do really, you know, that for no good reason, right? I mean, why did the Texas Rangers hire George W. Bush to be their president? Um, you know, was he really going getting a lot of favors from Washington for them? Probably not. But um, was he the best qualified person to run the Texas Rangers? Eh, probably not either, right? Um, now, Hunter Biden is not George W. Bush, but there are some analogies there. You know, they, they both had you know some drug issues. They both um, were not the... Uh, um, I would I, I wouldn't this way to say the black sheep of their family, but they weren't the number one son um, in either case. I don't think of, of the the president who we associate them with. Uh, of course, George W. went on to be president himself. So um, you know, um, whereas I don't think Hunter Biden's ever going to be anywhere near public office. But um, but nonetheless, right? I mean, I, I do think there there is the question of is it, there's a lot of smoke. Is there fire? I don't think there's a lot of fire. But and I think if people were, you know, I think the Republicans have tried really, really hard to find fire and haven't found it, um, which tends to suggest to me there probably isn't a lot of fire. But um, but again, you know, that's goes back to the bigger question of Trump and campaign tactics and muttering the waters and that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Um so we do have a kind of an interesting follow-up question. It's not really a, a legal question, but I think it's an important question um, from Autumn in the chat. And that, that is, um, do you think the Republican Party will ever be like it was before the Trump campaign or presidency? Um, I've noticed a distinct shift towards polarization, both between the Republican and Democratic parties and within the Republican Party itself. Do you ever think we will regain a more moderate across the aisle attitude in our political parties moving forward? It's a very good, insightful question. That I think, unfortunately, we're not going to have a good answer for you. For. I, I would argue, um, no. The you have to go back to 2010. Um, in 2008, uh, President Barack Obama was elected president, or Senator Barack Obama was elected president. The first midterm election after that, and first midterms after a presidential election are always going to see losses to that political party's uh, control of the House or the Senate. But something unique happened. It was called the Tea Party. Uh, the Tea Party was an aggressive. Um, almost militant fringe element of the Republican Party that emerged in 2010. There was some there was a visceral reaction to President Obama from the Republican Party. I'm not entirely sure what variable was at play, what it was about President Obama, but something about President Obama stirred something deep inside the Republican Party. That's where it began. And you see a, an enormous number of freshman representatives in particular coming into Congress. Fast forward to 2016, what was birthed with the Tea Party came to fruition with the Trump administration's presidency. It was a change election. It was an election where the, the status quo candidates not necessarily as attractive and surprising to everyone, President Trump won. And this created a new uh, reality in the Republican Party. Uh, this is neither good nor bad content neutral, I guess. However, uh, the Republican Party is currently evolving. They are in a, an evolutionary period and something is going to come from this, possibly this decade. It's not necessarily what we would call a critical election because this is occurring over multiple years, 
but the Republican Party is morphing into something different. I would expect possibly what we consider traditional Republicans from, I don't know, the 90s, the 80s might emerge in a new party or what is the Trump slash Tea Party um, section of the current Republican Party might branch off into some third party or it might take over the Republican Party. And this is what the Republican Party is. Um, that's the best way I can answer that in, in terms of will we have a Republican Party with the elephant back to pre-Trump? But I would argue you have to say pre-Tea Party days. Uh, I don't see that. I think we're in a transition that's taking more than a decade uh, and we don't necessarily know what's going to come out on the other end. I definitely don't predict a third party with any real power because third parties don't have any real power in a single member plurality voting system. Uh, but I would answer quickly. I failed to answer this quickly because I'm still talking. Uh, no, I don't see the traditional uh, Republican Party emerging from this except for something like that. Um, it's it, the, the change is, is, is just too deep. Uh, it's a different party. All of that's opinion. Dr. Watson, do you want to add anything to that? Um, the other thing I, I, I might add um, is, you know, um, I, I would almost argue that you, you can predate this back even further. Uh, you could arguably say this is really um, Clinton, right? 1992, 1994, uh, the contract with America. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes I can't think of that as almost the proto Tea Party, right? New Gingrich and, you know, who very much was a firebrand kind of, you know, the wrestling away control of the Republican Party from the um, Rockefeller Republican wing that essentially kind of run things off and on for the last 40 years. Now, of course, run the, by run things, I mean, been in the minority in Congress um, because, um, you know, that was a Republican Party that was, for better, or for worse, always kind of on the back foot uh, in Congress and particularly in the House and um, had kind of accommodated itself to that. And basically, you know, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, um, I mean, Goldwater's critique that the Republicans were kind of a, were an echo and not a choice um, sort of applied to them um, in that they were kind of. Um, Democrats light or de the slightly more conservative version of the uh, Democrats. So, so some of that's time bound. Some of that is because the Democrats themselves were a much bigger tent back in before um, before the 1990s, right? Because of um, the the delayed effects of realignment in the South, because of you know the fact you still have a lot of Southern conservative Democrats that had not um, transitioned over, particularly in congressional and state politics. Uh, to the more, you know, nationally conservative Republican Party. Um, and, you know, and I think, you know, but, but there were still kind of those moderate elements and they, you know, but, but in the 1990s, they kind of got more sidelined. Um, and then, of course, the Tea Party came and put them even more sidelined to the point that, you know, you know, Newt Gingrich would probably, you know, at least the Newt Gingrich of 1994 would probably be seen as kind of a, uh, a rhino today um, by probably a lot of Republicans, um, even though uh, at the time he was certainly not. Um, um, you know, he was more on the the center right of his party, or maybe even the right right of his party. Um, so, and I think the other thing is, you know, I don't know if we're necessarily. Uh, the, the, I think there was kind of an imagined past that there was this comedy. Um, not necessarily imagined, uh, um, but I, I think it was a time bound past. It was a time, it was a, it was a period when, again, we were in that transition period between a, a dominant democratic party that was a very big tent and incorporated basically everybody from Strom Thurmond to, um, uh, Adam Clay, Clayton Powell, um, which are two names that probably mean nothing to anybody in, the, uh, in this room, including my uh, fellow panelists. Um, but, um, you know, for, for essentially, a, you know, a segregationist um, through and through to, you know, a black congressman from Detroit, right, or New York, in the case of Adam Clayton Powell was from New York. Um, 
And, uh, you know, that was the Democratic Party in 1960-something, right? Maybe not. I think Strom was gone by then, but Jesse Helms was still there, and a bunch of other uh, ex-Dixiecrats were still there, right? Um, and, you know, um, uh, you saw that cross-aisle cross sort of moderation in part because the parties weren't that distinct ideologically. Um, they were more distinct in terms of support bases and geography and things like that that you know uh, um i mean then you know i don't want to get oversimplify things but um and this was before the rise of social issues in particular as a major distinguishing factor between the two parties so um is it possible that a more moderate party republican party can reemerge um hmm. um I, I suspect not under the party system that we currently have constituted. Um, at the same time, um, we know the party system is going through a very big upheaval. Um, I was reading on the platform for Wayne Newman's Twitter today or yesterday, um, you know, that the uh, when you look at white voters, the economic foundations of the two parties have essentially reversed that um, the Democratic Party's base among white voters is now the relatively well off, and the Republican Party base among white voters is the relatively less well off, um, which portends for a very, very different sort of politics than a left-right politics of economics where the Republicans are the party of business and wealth and the Democrats are the party of populism and labor and that sort of thing, right? Which I think you're starting to see, right, with Donald Trump, for example, going to uh, Detroit to try to, you know, kind of steal some of uh, Joe's thunder with the UAW. Um, some people are going to argue he's probably not going to have a lot of success with that. But then again, you know, there were the Reagan Democrats, right? There were, you know, union people that um, certainly went and became, uh, you know, Reaganites, at least for a little while. Um, so, so I don't know if I got an answer for that. Um, that's gonna make anybody happy. Um, but um, but I do think we're we're kind of in an unusual sort of coalitional rearrangement of the parties. I don't know if it's a realignment or a, um, or what. Um, but but there is something odd going on. Um, and until the dust settles from that, I don't know what. What is going to be the outcome of that? Um, that said, um, the other uh, the other point I, I, I kind of think is Trump is almost sui generis, and what I mean by that that's a Latin term, which basically means you know in of himself, right? There, there is only one Donald Trump, right? Um, and everybody that's tried to be Donald Trump has not really succeeded at being Donald Trump so far. Um, the people that tried and you know aped some of the stuff either gave up on it at some point, right? You know, think of somebody like Brian Kemp, for example, who kind of aped some of Donald Trump's stuff and then realized that it wasn't really working for him. Um, and you know, even Ron DeSantis, right, has had to sort of move away from some of his Trumpist sort of things, although arguably to appeal to the right of Trump's new supporters that are now a bit more populist and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, is this, you know, once Trump passes from the state, which is inevitable because it happens to everybody, um, the, is there anybody to pick up that mantle and carry it forward? And, you know, who is that person, right? There's a lot of people auditioning for that role, um, um, but it doesn't seem like anybody uh, has captured that appeal. And, if there's no appeal, if this is just a kind of, a, you know, in Italy, Berlusconi had a successor, right? Uh, more or less, right? The, the current leader of Italy is essentially a Berlusconi, a younger Berlusconi, a female younger Berlusconi. But, um, but uh, that sort of figure is not emerged here in the United States. Um, and I don't, I don't see an obvious one that is. Um, 
can um, the the counter question can the Democrats become more moderate? You know, um, I guess the question uh, is not so much can the Democrats become more moderate. The question is can the Democrats go back to being a big tent, right? A bigger tent, right? A tent that includes people that are pro-life. A tent that includes um, people that are socially conservative to some degree, right? Um, if they can do that, right, then they can go back to being electorally dominant, right? Um, but um, but how you keep them all on side in a system where there is an opposition party, I don't know, right? Um, the the one thing about the Democrats' big ten of the 50s, you know, 60s was that the Republicans weren't a viable opposition party in much of the country, right? Um, now they are, right? Um, I mean, they're not a viable opposition party in California, but um, but that's not really the same problem. Um, so um, I think I think that's awfully speculative, but all I've got basically. Um, let's see. Um, so I know uh, we're running a little short of time, but I also know that we want to uh, talk about one more case. Um, I do want to make sure we have time to talk about it, and that is uh, uh, the court's decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, uh, which of course radically reshaped, uh, uh, you know, the constitutional interpretation of um, uh, abortion rights. Um, so. Um, I realize we're running short on time, but I do want to give everybody on the panel at least an opportunity to talk a little bit about it. Um, so how would you summarize what the outcome of that decision has been and um, what are where does that seem to be reared as policy and I guess court future kind of legal wrangling in that area uh, seem to be going in the future to really paraphrase my original question. And uh, I know Annie wanted to talk to the, about this in particular, so I'll let her start if, if she wants to. So a little bit of background on the case for anyone uh, trying to catch up. In 2018, Mississippi passed a law that banned pretty much all abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Only exceptions allowed were to save the life of the pregnant individual. So no exceptions for rape, no exceptions for incest. Uh, the Jackson Women Health Organization, which was the only abortion clinic in Mississippi, sued. And so based on Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, uh, previous cases that established the sort of national level approach to abortion, lower courts prevented the enforcement of this law, um, but the Supreme Court struck down Roe and Casey instead and ruled that Mississippi's ban could stand. So what this, um, the effect this had was that it removed national level regulations for abortion and uh, reverted to either anything the states already had on the books pre-Roe, anything they had put on since, uh, or the things that they have made since the decision. And so today, I went and checked today for the New York Times Live Tracker, the abortion is banned in almost all circumstances in 14 states. It's banned after two weeks in two states, 12 weeks in two states, 15 weeks in two states, and 18 weeks in two states, sort of separately from the full bans. Uh, their ban is currently being blocked or disputed in another five states, and then it remains legal, uh, and in some cases with new protections in 25 states. And so right now, that is how abortion is, is regulated in the United States, it's on a state-by-state -state basis. We've seen some grumblings in Congress, we've seen some moves, but they have not yet passed a, a national or federal level regulation for the United States. When it comes to uh, legal consequences of this, there are a lot. And so there's certainly been arguments made that the same ruling, the same logic that was used here could be applied to other issue areas as well. And so in his concurring opinion on Dobbs, Justice Thomas suggested the protections for contraception access for same-sex marriage and even same-sex sexual intimacy could potentially be reconsidered, even though the majority opinion in Dobbs uh, sort of explicitly said that they weren't calling those things into question. Thomas said that perhaps we should, based on the legal recognition here. When it comes to the um, like the actual sort of lived experience effects, what we see internationally even is that abortion bans don't decrease abortion rates. 
Instead, you increase health problems, you increase maternal mortality rates, you increase the number of, of individuals who've been pregnant and children who are living in poverty. Uh, you increase illegal abortions and unsafe abortions. And so what you see are, are not kind of the, the outcomes that these bans are intended to make. Um, what you see are that abortions continue and they're just unsafe and, and deadly instead. And so that is in four minutes how abortion stands in, in the United States at this moment. Dr. Hall? Great summary. Uh, the only thing I would add would be something we're covering in class right now. Uh, everything about uh, abortion rights established in 1973 Roe was predicated on the substantive due process right of privacy established in the 1965 Griswold versus Connecticut case involving Connecticut condoms. So what uh, Dr. Uh, what, what we just covered was accurate. Justice Alito's opinion does say this does not apply. This is not to be construed to a, to possibly attack any other liberties that have been guaranteed under privacy. Having said that, he and all the other six justices, when they were before a Senate subcommittee going up for confirmation, also said that Roe was settled law. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. Now, regarding Justice uh, Thomas's dissent, that was bonkers almost. I, I didn't mean to say bonkers. Justice Thomas's dissent was a direct attack on privacy, on substantive due process. He would get rid of all of it. And then he said that we could then come back with legislation to guarantee these things or constitutional amendments. So will the dismantling of the constitutionally protected right to an abortion predicated on privacy, will that expand into other liberties that might one day have landmark court opinions that we're talking about in years to come? Possibly, um, despite Justice Alito's assurances to the contrary. With that being said, I noticed it's 6.33, and I'm going to force myself to stop talking there uh, and turn it back uh, to Dr. Lawrence to see where we're going to go. But um, yes, the current affairs in abortion rights, we've gone literally back to 1973, and it's a state issue. With 14 states banning it at contraception, meaning 14 states that have banned it completely. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I did want to make sure we got that in there. Um, there is well, one thing I, I would add, and this actually ties in with the previous question um, is about, you know, can the Republicans, I don't know if moderate is quite the right word, but um, it, from a political perspective, I think Dobbs has increasingly obviously become an electoral liability for Republicans, something that, uh, you know, pro, former President Trump acknowledged in an interview earlier this week um, that did not endear him much to the conservative base of his party. Um, essentially, he attacked, among other people, Ron DeSantis. Uh, um, I don't know if he attacked him by name, uh, but he certainly attacked, uh, you know, his, his actions to, um, you know, essentially uh, put in place a, uh, a uh, you know, a, a abortion restrictions in Florida. Um, ironically, DeSantis himself reportedly is not all that much of an abortion fanatic one way or the other, but apparently feels the political need to be a very hardcore pro, uh, pro-life uh, politician or anti-choice politician, uh, whatever terminology you want to use there, um, which is neither here nor there. But um, but the, the point is that, you know, there there is a there are these countervailing pressures within the Republican Party, on the one hand, for electability, on the other hand, for um, there is a element of the base that is very, very heavily committed to abortion restrictions beyond what's even on the books in most states. And the this is the sort of thing that could, I wouldn't necessarily say moderate the Republican Party, but put them in a position where they would find it difficult to win very many elections outside of very solidly red states. Um and in that case, being put in the political wilderness might eventually lead to some moderation just simply because they would want, you know, at the end of the day, as um, as one famous political scientist put it, um, you know, at the end of the day, politicians want to be in power, right? Um, and the entire purpose of political parties is to gain political power. And it doesn't do you any good to gain political power if you've got a political position that two thirds of the public thinks is ridiculous. Right. Um, which um, and Republicans in the past have always kind of banked on this idea that they could kind of convince people that the hardcore pro 
pro-life position uh, was um, what they really wanted. They just couldn't articulate it. Um, and I think the reality of post Dobbs is they're finding it much harder to make that argument than they thought it was going to be. Um, of course, there was also a more pragmatic part of the Republican Party that never thought they were going to catch the bus, right? From a you know the old dog catching the the bus sort of argument, where you know you don't want to catch the bus because then you got to deal with the bus. Um, so, um, the but yeah, as both Dr. Watson and Dr. Dr. Hall pointed out, right? The you know definitely this is a decision that fundamentally reshaped the law in this area, and probably fundamentally reshaped the politics in this area as well. Um, and unfortunately, um, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, um, depending on how long you've been up today, I guess, um, I think that probably means that we're kind of out of time. We're actually well beyond out of time. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank um, first our audience for uh, coming and participating. And I apologize we weren't able to get to all of your questions. Matter of fact, we didn't even get to <laughs> anywhere close to all the questions we had. Um, I think I had originally down nine questions and we got to six of them um and that's actually kind of a record for us usually we get through at least like eight or nine uh plus a couple audience questions too um but i think that uh you know was reflective of just how much there is to talk about when it comes to the constitution and constitutional rights and the supreme court and what the and arguably you know how um um dramatic some of the supreme court's decisions have been in terms of their effects on the law and that sort of thing. Um, if you are interested in future discussion events, we've got another one coming up in a couple of weeks uh, that we'll be saying also announcements for in the next couple of days. Uh, this one will be on global politics, international politics, international events. So we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of things that are going on in the world, some of which you may have heard of, some of which are maybe a bit more obscure. So um, we'll probably talk a little bit about the Russo-Ukrainian conflict, although we've got another event that's probably going to come up later on this semester. It's going to focus specifically on that. Um, you know, some of the issues that are going on with um, um, in uh, in Africa, we've had a series of uh, coups in Africa that um, have been uh, pretty uh, dramatic and um, maybe uh, endangering st uh, the stability of the region there. Um, uh, develop uh, an Argentinian presidential election coming up that's going to be very interesting in terms of uh, its effects. Um, a, a very a right wing populist candidate there is uh, uh, looking like he may uh, gain the presidency and has talked about things like getting rid of the Argentinian currency and replacing it with the dollar and all sorts of things. So. Um, so lots of interesting topics that we may talk about there. So uh, look out for that. Uh, like I said, we're probably doing that in about two weeks. Um, uh, and we'll probably have at least a couple more uh, discussion events this semester as well. Um, also, I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Watson and Dr. Hall for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us today and uh, for uh, um, contributing their expertise. Um, our, our dean was unable to make it. He's uh, he's out of town on uh, on business, but um, we will. Uh, he wanted me to pass on his regards to you all as well. Um, if you do want to watch this recording for some reason, uh, it will be posted on YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. We'll get that posted for you guys. Um, and um, out of that one last reminder, if you uh, did join uh, us and uh, are here for some sort of uh, credit in the class or through, um, uh, I think there may be an Area B credit. I don't know if there's some sort of credit for attending events or something like that that's out there. Um, and you're not logged into your MG account, do post your full name somewhere in the chat. Uh, if you're logged into your MG account, you're fine. But if you're if you're not, um, if you got guest next to your name and the guest name is not you, um, make sure it's you. Um, make sure we know who you are so you get credit. Um, and we make sure you get your credit you deserve. Um, so uh, thank you all again. And uh, uh, have a good evening. And uh, I guess we'll see you all soon.